All right, good morning, church. Hey, this morning we're going to continue in our study where we left off a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to jump right into it if it's okay with you. So if you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As always, the text is also on the back of your notes as you came in this morning. We're going to put them on the screens for you as well. But I want to let you know ahead of time that as you leave here today, I really have one goal for you, and that, that goal is this. I, I, I pray that every single one of you understands how incredibly valuable you are and how important you are to the health, the life, and the unity of the church. Scottsdale can be a very lonely place. You know, Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the nation. Maricopa County, consistently one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. And yet there is extreme loneliness everywhere. It's like on one hand, we are more connected technologically, right? But people feel more disconnected than ever. Loneliness was it's kind of like the original not good in all of God's creation. God creates the heavens and he says, it's good. He creates light and he says, good. He creates plants, animals, good, good. And then he creates Adam. And it's the first time God says, there's something that's not good in creation. Adam's lonely, which is really interesting because he had God. But yet there was a sense that Adam was alone. And so what does God say? He says, I'm going to create him a helper, someone that is just like him. And so he creates Eve. When when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, in his moment of extreme anguish, intense anxiety, just a few hours before the cross, he says, James, Peter, John, I need the three of you guys to come with me. I don't want to be alone. (laughs) I'm about to face death by crucifixion. I'm going to carry the sins of the world upon my shoulders. And I'm going to go and I'm going to pray. So he takes this prayer walk in the Garden of Gethsemane and he doesn't do it alone. Now here's the thing. The sad fact of the matter is that churches can be really lonely places. More so, the the larger a church becomes, it's kind of a strange phenomenon. The more isolated people can feel. And that was never God's intention for his people, the church. And so last week we learned that God has actually gifted every single believer to help combat this, right? In the form of at least one spiritual gift. And we talked about how the spiritual gifts are not about you. Spiritual gifts are about others, right? Paul says it's for the common good. So my gift is not about me. My gift is about you. It's about being a blessing to you. It's about building up the congregation. And the problem for these Corinthian believers living in the first century, they had it all wrong. That either they thought, well, my gifts aren't that important, therefore I'm not that important, so I don't really count. And then you had those who were like, my gift is really important, and I'm kind of superior to others. And they were using the good things that God had given them, and they were fragmenting the congregation. And so Paul writes to correct their behavior, and he says essentially, it is absurd and ridiculous for you to take the good things that God has given you and use them to promote disunity. There are a wide variety of gifts, skills, talents, and abilities, and therefore the common good. And so in order to emphasize or highlight this point, to help people understand, Paul uses an analogy between the church and the physical body. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, for just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So here's what Paul is saying, the body of Christ, that is the church, is one. Why? Because we were all baptized into the same spirit. We weren't baptized into different spirits. Remember, the word baptized carries the idea of identification. In other words, the Christian community is one in unity because we were all identified in the same spirit, the spirit of God, that is the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's, it's as if Christians all over the world are wearing one jersey. And that jersey simply reads Team Jesus. And so Paul is about to launch into a conversation and help them understand that whatever dividing lines you've created, they are artificial 
unnecessary, and that is what is leading to the chaos in your midst. And so here, here's the, the, the sad reality for, for many churches today all over the world. They still create dividing lines. Dividing lines over skin color, over economics, uh, politics. Paul says, that's absurd. It's ridiculous. Don't you understand that you've all been identified in the same spirit of God. There is one spirit and that spirit breeds unity. This is nothing new. Um, going all the way back to the early infancy of the church, you had the church in Jerusalem. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And the church in Jerusalem was made up of Jews who had come to embrace Jesus as the Messiah. You know, they understood the Old Testament and they were looking for a Messiah. And so they were reading the details and trying to figure out who he is and when he's going to come. And then Jesus comes on the scene and wow, Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies. And so the Jews have found their Messiah. So now we have Jews who have converted from Judaism to Christianity. And they're thinking, this is it. It doesn't get any better. Everything's been completed. And then the church in Jerusalem hears that God is at work amongst the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And some, some of these Jewish believers are like, wait a minute, can this be the case? I mean, isn't God just for one specific race? But then they're confronted with the fact that the Spirit of God is working supernaturally amongst the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And they realize any division that we would throw up that would isolate other people from being part of the family of God is completely and totally artificial. It's divisive. It breeds disunity. Because here's the bottom line. Every single one of us is a sinner separated from God. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your politics is. <laughs> that is the great unifier of all mankind. Everyone's on bended knee at the foot of the cross, exposed as a sinner in need of a savior. This is why you, you, you can walk into a room full of Christians whom you've never met before. They, they could be completely from a completely different culture. And there's an instant bond, an instant connection. My 19-year-old son has been in Uganda for the last couple of weeks. He gets home tonight. And last Sunday, he said, Dad, I attended the most incredible church service ever. I'm like, okay, that was a little hurtful. <laughs> You've only been in several hundred with me. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, Dad, the, 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 the teaching was solid, so solid, straight from the Bible. And he said, the worship was just, it was amazing. He said, but you know the best part about it? I said, let me guess, the people. He said, yeah, Dad. He said, the people. He said, I just, I could feel the love. I could feel the warmth and just an instant connection. And he's like, I don't know. He's like, I like it here. It kind of feels like home here in Uganda. My boy's born and raised in Scottsdale. <laughs> Do you understand what's happening? He walks into the room, experiences the church. See how I put that? This is a room. The church is the experience. And what is he experiencing? He's experiencing the same thing that other people in the room are experiencing. And that is the most intense experience anybody could ever have. A room full of people who have been radically transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when you walk into the room, you, you don't immediately see all the common differences that our world sees. You follow? Those things just kind of melt away. Because what you experience is this, look, the more intense the experience, the more intense the community. 
And so he walks in and he experiences an intense, life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which he has experienced himself, and there's an instant bond. There's an instant connection that supersedes and transcends anything else. And the problem for the Corinthian church is they just weren't getting it. Some people were using their gifts as a way of elevating themselves. I'm better than you. We'll see in the next couple of weeks. Some were longing for gifts that were more visible, more public. Why? So that they could appear more spiritual, something special. And Paul is about to strip all of that away. I received a very encouraging email this week, and it's really the encouragement is for you, not me, so I want to pass it along. We do partner with several different ministries who are on the front lines, and they're reaching uh, people that, uh, that need to be reached for Christ and, and people that are, are very much sort of on the outside of many faith communities. And one of them sent an email saying, you know what I love about Illuminate? When I walk through these doors, nobody looks down on me. Nobody treats me as if I'm less than. Because when I'm out there, what I get is a lot of condescension, but I don't get it here. And that's the way it should be. Because as people come through these doors and we're with each other, everything else melts away. And we have this common experience of the radical transformation power, transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Having said that, I'll say this. There's also a lot of people that come through our doors that look like they have their act together. And they don't. A lot of people that look really polished on the outside and on the inside, man, they are dying. They are hurting. They're lonely. And it's probably the last person you'd look at and say, really? Him? Her? Absolutely. I- I'm convinced that um, the powers of darkness want to keep things in the dark. That's why they have that tagline. Powers. If you can keep things hidden, things won't, aren't brought to light, there's no healing. And so the difference is one person says, I need help. The other person says, I can do it myself. And I'm convinced that today, perhaps more than ever, we have been conditioned to isolate ourselves. We're not good at stepping into open, honest, and vulnerable relationships. Now, I'm not bashing social media, okay? I'm, not, I'm just giving you an observation when I say what I'm about to say next. But the reality is with social media, it's everybody's highlight reel. It's always a best of collection. And that's really challenging in this day and age. You know, especially for the people that are younger. It's like, it's like the picture of me and my family on the beach or at the mountains, smiling, holding hands and praying. It's never the picture of me screaming at my kids. And what happens is we look at that stuff and we're like, man, look at the life. Look at, I mean, they've got their junk together. I wish I was like that, but I'm not. And so what happens is we go inward and we think, if people get to know the real me, they're not going to like me. So it's all about image control in our day. I'm going to release exactly what I want to in order to make you think a certain way about me. And then it becomes this gnarly cycle where we're all putting forth these projections and we end up burying each other in it. And our souls have this like deep longing for what is real and what is vulnerable. And we were created to be in these kinds of relationships. You say, how, how so? Well, Genesis chapter one, we were created in the image of God. God is a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternal existence together, partnering together, sharing together. And so we, being created in the image of God, are made for these kinds of relationships as well. And we take it seriously here. That's why last week we spent some time talking to you about this small group experience that we want to bring to every person that calls Illuminate Community Church their home. It's called Rooted. It's a 10-week vulnerable, interactive time where you get to make friends, you get to be cared for. And the other side of that is you also have the opportunity to care for others. Because as we said last week, we need each other and we need you. And we don't always recognize it, 
but God created us for this purpose. And so what Paul does next is he uses the analogy and pushes it forward a little bit to prove it to you. Verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has done the arrangement. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So here's the point Paul is making. In this room right now, there's a tremendous diversity of gifts, talents, and skills. And this diversity is absolutely necessary for us to function well. And no one body part is any more important than another. But for the Corinthians, they disagreed. There was sort of the spiritual hierarchy. Some people in the church are more important than other people. And you know what that does? That breeds disunity. And Paul says it's just not true. So here's, Paul's putting his finger on the problem in the church. It's kind of like this. I don't think much about my intestines until something goes wrong. I was in Guatemala, Guatemala City, and I had visited, uh, believe it or not, you know, they're, they're in the city, in the center of Guatemala City, there is a dump, and there are several thousand people that live in that dump. They're living off of the trash of what is essentially, in many ways, a third world society. Unemployment's about 30%. It, this is a crazy place. You go, and I, you know, it's like, I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, smell sensitive, and so I go there, and I'm like getting the dry heaves just smelling it. It takes several hours just to get used to the smell. There's all kinds of disease and bacteria. So we spend some time in the dump. On the outskirts of the dump, there's this ministry started by this blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman who went down. She visited as a reporter. She's a Christian. She's like, we, we got to help. She started this ministry called Casita Benjamin. She feeds the kids, cleans the kids, this whole thing. It's an amazing ministry. So we spent some time ministering to the people in this dump. And I come back and I get sick. I mean, I get sick. I mean, like, I'm ready to go to the hospital. I don't really think about what's going on inside me until something goes on. I'm pretty sure I picked up some kind of parasite that you could see with the naked eye. You know what I'm saying? There's some crazy stuff going on down there. And I was... Every single part is important. But here's the problem. Some people were like, man, you know, feet aren't as glamorous as hands. And I'm just a foot. Eyes are way more beautiful than ears. When, when was the last time you heard somebody say, you have the most gorgeous ear lobes? <laughs> and, I, and I'm just an ear. And Paul says, don't you understand? Every single member is important for us to come together and function well. Think about the opposite of member. What is the opposite of member? Dismember. You know what membership means at Illuminate? We have a membership class today. You know what it means? Serve. And people say, I don't like membership. What's the opposite? You, you like being dismembered? <laughs> right? You want to be a bunch of body parts just laying around? Just a bunch of amputated body parts? You think that's healthy? Oh. This is the body that comes together. When the body comes together and everybody plays his or her part, it's such a beautiful thing. Because you see, all these needs are met. See, there are people in the room that have needs that you can meet in a very specific way. What are you doing about that? You have needs that only certain people in this room can meet in a very specific way way. And here's the thing that Paul says. He says, here, let, let's just calm down a little bit in our pride, because notice 
Um, God decides. He's the designer, right? God arranges the members as he chooses. So then, verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the, f- the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts, when my kids were little, we called those bathing suit parts, are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. So here, here, here's what he's saying. He's saying, you know, you, all these different parts of the body, all equally important. In fact, there, there are some that you think aren't so important, but you stop and think about it. You actually give those body parts quite a bit of attention. When I woke up this morning, I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking, huh, what am I going to wear on my hands? What am I going to cover my hands with? No, we spend a lot more time thinking, what are we going to cover our unpresentable parts with. That actually takes a little bit more thought. So you might say those parts are kind of important, even though some people may think they're less important. They're they're pretty important. Even though they, they may not be seen, they're pretty important parts. And now for the application, verse 24, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. This is the application, by the way, that's secure for our loneliness. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So here, Paul's theological point about the nature of the body of Christ has now come to a very specific application. The Corinthian Christians should care for one another because they're all a part of the same body. And in order for the body to function well, everybody does his or her part. Now, every once in a while, there's a part of the body that goes rogue, and it decides to live for itself. You know what we call that? Cancer. You know how cancer works. Raise your hand if you hate cancer. Yeah, your hand, you probably have a hand up because someone you know has died of cancer. Cancer took the life of my dad. My dad went from probably 160, 170 pounds, maybe to 100. Completely and totally changing, six foot two. Cancer takes, sucks the life. Cancer is is one of those things, it's, it's It's so greedy that it will suck the life out of that which feeds it until it itself dies. So there's this really fiery English preacher that lived a while ago, a Baptist preacher. He died in 1892. His name is Charles Spurgeon. And so he said this to his congregation. This is an excerpt from one of his sermons. He said, I want every member of this church to be a worker. We do not want any drones. Now, I have to clarify what he means by drones. Drones, in this sense, are those bees that neither collect uh, pollen um, or nectar, okay? They're male honeybees. They don't have any stingers. They don't gather pollen or nectar. If there are any of you who eat and drink and do nothing, there are plenty of places elsewhere where you can do it. There are empty pews in abundance. Go and fill them. Every Christian who is not a bee is a wasp. The most quarrelsome persons are the most useless, and they who are the most happy are peaceable and are generally those who are doing most for Christ. So, amen, Charles Spurgeon. I think in many ways, Illuminate is doing really well. When I look around, I see a lot of health. We talked about that last week, what God is doing in our midst over and over again. We're continuously saying only God, and I'm super grateful for that. And we do have room for growth. How do I know that? Well, if every person that called Illuminate Community Church their church home, if every single person served and functioned as their body part, we would never have to ask for anything ever. Never. And so we have some room to grow. It's this idea that there are no unemployed Christians in the church. 
And if people come and they think, man, I'm here just to get my batteries charged, then the Holy Spirit's work in you and through you is going to be very, very limited. Because as I said earlier, think of it this way. Your name is written on the hearts of the people in this room. I hope you realize that. Your name is written on the hearts of your brothers and sisters in this room. So why do we do this? We do this, you know, I mean, think, think about it. You know, there are a lot of people who, uh, who are kind, who are generous, who give themselves. Uh, and, and Paul could have said, hey, just go serve, serve one another. But he doesn't. Instead, he gives you the theology behind it, talking about how we're all part of the body of Christ. So remember what it took for you to be in the body of Christ? It took Jesus to the cross. Jesus had to die to place you into the family of God. So the punishment that you and I deserved fell on Jesus with every strike of the hammer. In the garden, Jesus submitted his will to the will of the God, to the will of God for your sake. And so it, it, you put it like this, in a very real sense, Jesus took his hands off the wheel of his life and died for you so that you can take the hands off the wheel of your life and live for him. What could possibly be your excuse in holding you back from that? True story about a woman who suffered a vicious attack. It was so vicious that she lost her hands and her legs. And she wound up in a home for people who were disabled that couldn't take care, that had no one to take care of them. This is actually uh, in, uh, in Argentina. And I had the opportunity to visit this place. And this lady was a Christian. And if there was ever a person that someone would look at and say, what could you possibly have to offer? A lot. So much so that I've told her story many, many times. So as you walk into this place, and it's pretty rough, they depend on um, donations. You walk in this place inside, you know, what grips you is you know, sort of the sights, not just the sights of these people that are physically, they're, they're suffering, but, you know, the smells as well. And as you walk through the door, you hear a sound. And this is the sound. And it's this lady dragging herself across the floor. And she looks up at you with the biggest, sweetest smile. And in her best English, she says, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Can I introduce you to some of my friends? And with this incredible amount of joy, she takes you from bed to bed and introduces you to all of her friends. And before you leave, she's going to ask you this question. Before you die, have you figured out where you're going? Do you know who Jesus is? And you can't help but sit there and listen to her. <laughs> because of this remarkable body part that functions so well that others may look at and go, unpresentable, less desirable. 
not glamorous, but incredibly necessary. I'm convinced she has the gift of encouragement, the gift of faith. And when you're around her, she's, it's just infectious. And I leave and I say to myself, Jason, what's your excuse? Come on now. What is your excuse? God has given us so much. Why? Because your name is written on my heart. My name is written on your heart. It's the love of Christ that compels us. Jesus took the hands off the wheel of his life and died for you so that you can take the hands off the wheel of your life and live for him. So Father, as we end our time together this morning, our deep prayer is that you would impress by the power of your Holy Spirit upon each heart here how incredibly valuable, important, how significant we are. Just in light of the fact that you would send Jesus to die for us. But it doesn't end there. That's what compels us to step out, to step into vulnerable relationships, open, honest, to become all that you want us to be so that we can become healthier and healthier body parts coming together and functioning well. Why? Not for our glory, but for yours, so that the name and the renown and the fame of Jesus Christ can be so widespread. We ask it in the name of the one who makes it all possible, and his name is Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen.